Today's video is going to be a little darker than usual. Unfortunately, we live in a time where deaths in the music world have grown more and more common, especially in the rap world. In this year alone, I can already think of multiple artists who have passed unexpectedly. Ever since these sudden deaths have become more common, there have been more and more examples of what are called posthumous albums, or records released after an artist's death. And just like any other grouping of albums, there are good examples and bad examples. So today, I'm going to present three different posthumous albums. A good example, an okay example, and a terrible example. I would also like to say that when I say good, okay, and terrible, I don't necessarily mean musically. Especially because they have since passed, it's hard to know or tell if the project in question was the way that the artist wanted it to sound, or if it was a quick money grab for the people who are profiting from the record. So, without further ado, let's talk about some albums. No, I, that was, I, I didn't like that, that was, that was cringy. Boy. Rapper Pop Smoke was sadly shot to death on February 19th, 2020 during a home invasion. His second studio album, Meet the Woo 2, had been released only 12 days before he was killed, which means that a lot of new fans were mourning. As it turns out, Pop already had a lot of finished and nearly finished songs put together, and so his mentor, 50 Cent, brought it upon himself to finish the unfinished songs and release them as a new album titled Shoot for the Stars, Aim for the Moon. The project came out on July 3rd, 2020 and was met with okay reviews. But as I said before, I'm not here to talk about the music. The reason that I said that the posthumous album was okay was because, while the album was put in the hands of someone who knew Pop very well, the record only came out five months after his death. Personally, I feel as though they should have waited a little longer. Not even half a year has passed since his death and they already felt the need to release new music. Even if the album had already been done, the label could have waited much longer until they dropped the album. This is the difference between the okay and the good. Time. Mac Miller's Circles is a perfect example of the way a posthumous album should be released. First things first, unlike Pop Smoke's album, Circles was technically a sequel to Mac's previous album Swimming. Swimming in Circles, do you, you get it? Not just that, but once again, unlike Pop's album, Swimming came out about a year and four months after Mac OD'd. This allowed more time for not just his fans to overcome a sudden death, but also his family and friends. This also allowed plenty of time for John Bryan, a close friend of Max, who also produced many of the tracks off of Swimming, plenty of time to get Circles to sound the way he and Mac had discussed it would sound. All of these things combined made for an amazing album. I almost feel like not releasing this album would have been more disrespectful, mostly because it was so close to being done, on top of the fact that it completed the Swimming Circles duo. So, I talked about examples of two different posthumous albums, one that I consider to be extremely respectful to the artist in question, and one that's... meh. But what happens when a dead artist is used for money? Music executives have and always will be pieces of shit, so did it surprise me when they used XXXTentacion's leftover work and squeezed it for all it's worth? Nope. Not at all, actually. But did it surprise me when I found out that his own mother was involved in the money machine that pumped out as much merchandise as possible? Hell yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it did. Jose Onfroy, or XXXTentacion, was shot in his car after robbers saw that he was carrying lots of cash to pay for a motorcycle on his Instagram story. That happened in June of 2018. Since then, his mother, as well as his label, have released two albums that contain a total of 35 songs. The first of the two albums, Skins, was released to the public only five months after his death. Which is fine, I mean whatever, that's no different from Pop Smoke's most recent album. But his most recent release, Bad Vibes Forever, was released almost a year and a half after his death and was stacked with 25 songs. However, the album was only 55 minutes long. It was packed with features, mostly because the only recordings they had left from X were way too short to be complete songs. It was almost like he was being featured on his own album, while the other artists were the main focus. He took a back seat on his own project that he didn't even say it was okay to release. At the end of the day, his label and his own mother saw these last scraps left of him as an opportunity to make more cash. To me, this is despicable. It's incredibly sad to see when artists are taking advantage of. This is something that happens constantly, and something that has been normalized by the industry. But to see it happen to someone who is deceased? Someone who can't speak up, who can't put their final say in? Someone whose deleted songs and rough cuts were just sent out into the world without any choice in the matter? That's a whole new low. So, you may be asking, Jackson, maybe you should, I don't know, try to find a solution instead of yelling on the internet? And as a response, I'd like to say, give me five seconds, dude, chill, goddamn. Because not only do I have one solution, I have two. First of all, I think artists need to start having conversations with their labels. Make it clear that if God forbid something should happen, that their unfinished rough cuts won't be sent out to the world like X's were. 
It's like a safety net or a will. I'm not here to tell them how to release their music. If a certain artist doesn't care where their music goes after they pass, then who cares? You do you. If there are certain circumstances in which an artist would like their work to be released, then they should be able to negotiate that too. I just think that these conversations need to happen, because if they don't, I promise that we're going to see more and more examples of dead artists being taken advantage of. So that's solution number one. But don't worry, I understand that negotiating with labels is insanely difficult, and that most big music execs wouldn't give two fucks about what the actual artists have to say. So to prevent that, here's my counter solution. Go to any social media platform and simply say, if I die, I will not release any music. If I pass and music continues to be put out under my name, discredit it, it's not mine. While this won't totally prevent more music to be released, it puts a lot of pressure on the labels to not put out anything. And if anything is released, then I'm sure a diehard fan would pull up the post and shout out to the world that you never authorized the release of that music. So, are either of these solutions perfect? Hell no. Are they both probably super underthought and naive because I know nothing about how the corporate side of the music industry works? Probably yes. But who am I to tell artists how to live their lives? Or their deaths? I, I, I don't know, you know what I'm trying to say. Whoa, 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 hold on. Video's not over. First things first, I'd like to say thanks for the support in the last few videos. I recently hit 100 subs, which might not seem like a lot to most people, but I like to think about it like 100 people all in my house would be crowded. So, I don't know, it's a small victories, but thanks to everyone who has subbed, because every time that number goes up, it always makes my day. Secondly, I've started actually being active on Twitter, so if anyone watching this wants to see more of me trying my hardest to be funny, then check that out or shoot me a DM. I promise you there's nothing better I could be doing. So yeah, yeah, thanks y'all.